Good morning, I'm James Carlin, the product manager for Dampers here at Podorf. Uh, it's just about the top of the hour, so it's a good time for us to get started. We've got a presentation set up uh, by Larry Felker, uh, the manager for product management of fire and smoke actuators at the Lumo. And we're gonna go through and look at some different fire smoke damper actuators and some selection and applications. Uh, so without further ado, I can uh, move this over to Larry and we can get going. Hello. Thank you. Uh, the uh, subject course is uh, fire smoke damper actuator uh, replacement uh, uh, applications. Uh, um, here is the agenda. And we are not going to be able in, you know, the 50 minutes we're going to have here to cover all aspects of the subjects. So if there's anything anyone wants, uh, either questions we don't get to or subjects you want uh, some more depth in, uh, the last slide has both James and my uh, email addresses, and you can contact uh, either one of us, and uh, we would cover subjects for you. Uh, so we're we're going to cover access to information is the most important thing. You cannot remember everything that uh, all the little details of the subject, uh, but once you know where to look things up or who to talk to, uh, makes life real easy. Uh, but nomenclature, mounting, torque, uh, wiring, and then replacements and retrofit details are uh, the main subjects here. So access to information, which is critical. At the top left, uh, the damper types, life safety. So you got your sealing radiation, your, your variety of fire smoke types, and then you got control and the other types of dampers, uh, backdrop balancing, any pressure relief. And then you've got all kinds of variations, pose blade, parallel, uh, airfoil, sleeve, so forth. Uh, so there's a lot of little details about each one of them. Uh, the things we're going to concentrate are over on the right, the actuated dampers, uh, the fire smoke dampers, uh, multi-plate smoke, and the new combination fire smoke. A little bit about control dampers. So. This is the variety of subjects we're, we're going to cover and why we don't have enough time to cover all of them. For Belimo for actuators, we do have a product guide and price list or a quick reference guide. Uh, both of those are available on our website and it can be downloaded. Uh, there's a variety of other documents there if you want to search around and find it by subject. So if you go on the www.belimo.us, at the very top of the main page is products. And if you click on products, you end up with a variety of all the sources of things you can look up. Uh, these are all product oriented uh, for the most part, except for the retrofit things at the very bottom. Uh, the fire of smoke and the damper actuators there have a lot of the technical information. The other place to look for a lot, of, you know, of course, a lot of information, particularly fire smoke, is the Potdorf site, uh, where they show all the actuators as well as all the dampers and accessories. So those are the most important uh, places for looking up information. This is basic, the actuator nomenclature. Clamp, the stop. You've got a round adapter there at the top. Uh, all the actuators also take square shafts, but you don't bump into them very much. So uh, the round gives you a variety of uh, sizes that you can uh, use and inserts for your shafts, anywhere from 3 8 inch up to 1 and uh, an eighth inch, all the common sizes in use in the industry. The left conduit connector is for the auxiliary switches if you're using them they're of course available without them also and then on your right there is your power cable and then flex conduit connectors can be put into those connectors the 
anti-rotation U-strap right there in the center of the actuator fits the stud on the anti-rotation strap. So your mounting is simply two nuts and two screws are going to go in to hold the anti-rotation strap. Uh, you could use a stud there also. This is the five actuators that we make that cover the range of torques from 18 inch pounds up to 180 inch pounds. Uh, probably 98% of fire smoke actuators that go in are two positions, so it's drive open, spring close. There is one modulating model also. I'm not going to try to cover the part numbers, there's no way one could remember all the things. Uh, first uh, look at them but they're all available on the websites the part numbers have a lot of variations to them that's part of why the documentation is so important uh, so you can look up the torque speed any of the little options you you want the voltages and then the type of control so for the control actuators you've got quite a few different types of control that can be used uh, then you have models that are with a built-in auxiliary switch or without, and you got your NEMA uh, variations, NEMA 4 being the one that's fairly popular, and there are heaters available for cold climates. On the bottom left, you've got a non-spring actuator, so that's what the style would look like, and on the right, you've got your spring return actuator. That's a good example of what the what the difference in their looks are. There are a variety of housing options. So if you need weather shield or, or heater, you've got them. But not every actuator has every variation available for it. So you got to look it up in the documentation. Mounting. Over on the right side picture here, you see a linkage setup. Of course, you're, for retrofits, that's pretty common, uh, but you'd like to avoid uh, using linkages and any uh, adapters if possible. We do have what's called the mounting methods guide. So if you type that in on the search engine at the top of the uh, the main page of uh, on the website, uh, you can download that. It has uh, roughly 100 pictures in it uh, showing you different linkage and mounting tricks. Uh, they're very helpful. Uh, we built that up uh, early on in the time when Belimo came to the United States, and uh, it, it has a real lot of good applications. The big issue when you're direct coupling, the left side picture, mount the anti-rotation strap stud in the center of the U-slot. That way, any non-concentric movement of the damper shaft or jack shaft is taken up and you let the actuator move up and down, you know, an eighth of an inch or so is common. And that way you don't bind. You don't add any torque by jamming that stud way up into the U-shaft. In addition, make sure the actuator is perpendicular. We'll now and then uh, get a problem job there where the somehow the actuators have not been marked, uh, mounted perpendicular, and that creates extra torque load, and the actuators will fail early, early being a couple of years. But uh, there's no need for that to happen as long as you mount them perpendicular. The anti-rotation strap, when you go to mount, very often you, you have to raise the actuator out. You can bend that anti-rotation strap, and at the very bottom there, that extreme bending is acceptable. As long as it's mechanically solid, uh, you don't have to worry about doing that. So that, that allows you to raise the actuator uh, to clear uh, bearing brackets or any other uh, obstructions that are in the way. We do have a mechanical accessories guide also available on the website with a lot of the adapters, linkages, ball joints, rods, etc. 
you can scan across that uh, the drawings here and get a good feel for all the things that are available. So here's an example of uh, a damper. Uh, it's an old retrofit. Uh, on the left side picture there, you can see the damper fairly well, but there was no damper shaft available for direct coupling. So we put in a little FSTF motor with a crank arm and linkage, and then use ball joints and rods to go up to a damper clip so that we can open and close that damper. You can the uh, second picture from the left, you can see a detail of the damper clip that we mounted. You can also use PopTorf parts. And then on the right pictures, you can see a detail of how the actuator was mounted. Of course, this is a bench mounting a lot easier than when you're up above the ceiling. But we did this prototype, and then we were able to copy it and do all the rest of the uh, dampers on the project. So it gives you an example of how that linkage is used. Left picture shows you the whole damper and how a couple of actuators are mounted to the jack shaft using the existing crank arm and then the Bolimo parts. So the middle picture shows you a little more of a detail. The right picture shows you a relatively uh, complicated linkage, but it worked fine. Uh, you had two dampers, so you link them together and then drive them with the actuator with a crank arm on it. Of course, you'd like to avoid these. Probably 90% of what we sell goes in with direct couple, but 90% of your problems occur where you got to use a linkage because there's extra work. Torque. This is an issue that comes up all the time, and people tend to think of anything that uh, isn't working well. Torque's always the first uh, uh, suspect. It's rarely a problem. Uh, we do have in our product guide and price list a detailed how to calculate the torque you need. It it's an art. There are no real engineering principles. There's no way for us to gauge. Uh, if a damper is uh, bound up or if corrosion is adding uh, extra uh, torque. But using this 10 steps, you can gauge pretty well how much torque you're going to need, which actuator to select. Uh, our attitude about replacement uh, is always uh, go to the next highest one. Uh, it's a small amount of money for the uh, uh, to avoid any possibility of having to take some off and put put them back on, uh, labor being expensive. But it's on our uh, product guide and price list in the current version on page 22-2. So it gives you a good way to, to gauge your torque. I'll give you some rules of thumb here also uh, as we move along. Uh, Potorf has uh, on their website, you can just simply for anything in particular for fire smoke, you simply use Potorf's uh, selected actuator because they've tested them and that's what's you all listed. Uh, but you can see there's a wide variety. I'm not going to try to go through each one of these. Uh, but you've got both 250 and 350 degree. Uh, that's 121C or 177C uh, motors and dampers. And you can see there's quite a range between what's available for the 3V dampers versus the airfoils. Hi, Larry. This is James. One thing to note for our reps as well, it's always a good idea to configure the damper in our pricing software. Uh, that's very uh, interactive, and that will give you the lowest cost actuator available. There are a lot of rules as to uh, specifics to what's available for some of these fire smoke dampers based on the testing that we've achieved. So it's always best to reference that software. Of course, uh, any of their customers can reach out uh, to our manufacturers reps to be able to get that configuration uh, whenever they need to. Yeah, there's such a wide variety. Here's some rules of thumb, particularly useful for retrofits, or if you're going to be gauging, uh, winging some numbers where you have to look at them. Uh, closed blade dampers at 2,000 feet per minute or less. You're going to need anywhere from five to seven inch pounds of torque per square foot. 
parallel blades, seven to 10, and round 10. But where the artwork or where the engineering judgment has to be applied is, well, if you've got uh, no side seals, older damper, then you go to the lowest number. Whenever you have an airfoil, go to the max number. They take more torque. Uh, but smaller dampers actually need less torque per square foot uh, than the larger dampers. Uh, there are no fluid dynamic numbers available to be able to gauge why uh, that happens, but we know it from observation and from UL testing. As soon as you're at, if you're operating at elevated temperatures, you need more torque. So the 250 or 350 uh, for a smoke damper testing is done at the elevated temperatures, but you actually need less torque to move the same damper at ambient temperatures. And, and whenever you put a linkage in, uh, the torque can be translated, uh, either magnified or subtracted at various positions. So it's a little bit uh, tough to really measure them. But the rules of thumb here have served us for uh, 30 years. And uh, I can't say I've had a, a torque problem job whenever I've used these. Uh, so five, seven, and 10 are the, the magic numbers. Top left, your pose blade, they need less. Bottom, parallel blade, you need more. Wiring. Chapter seven, and it's important for the rep to note whether he's got a chapter seven or a chapter nine application. Uh, it's not always clearly laid out by the consultant specs, and it, it can uh, cause you a little problem. But if it's a Chapter 7 application, you shouldn't need auxiliary switches unless they've specified that they want some remote indication right there uh, on the ceiling or somewhere in the room of whether the damper is open or closed. Mm -hmm. Chapter 9 you're going to need auxiliary switches because that's going to be connected to the smoke control system. Same dampers are used, but the controls are more complicated for the Chapter 9. So it is important to know what part of the code that damper is being installed for. Uh, roughly 85% are Chapter 7, roughly 15% are Chapter 9. So Chapter 9 is your smoke control. Chapter 7 is your compartmentation or, or containment. So containment, those are the dampers that are just put in the wall. We're going to have a smoke detector. No auxiliary switch is required unless the consultant is doing something special. But per code, there's no, no switches required. This is the wiring. If there's any wiring diagram to memorize, this is the one. It's not hard. We start with hot power over there on the left. We go into the smoke detector, or it could be a relay from a, a area smoke detection system, but more often it's going to be a smoke duct smoke detector. Uh, we got a normally closed contact. We simply go through and we go to the uh, high limit, the primary heat responsive device in UL's terminology. It's very typically 165 degree F. So you got two switches in series with the actuator. As long as you don't have smoke and the temperature is not elevated, the actuator drives open. The damper stays open until power is cut. So either the smoke detector can open up the power or the high limit temperature by metal can cut power. And either one of those would cause the actuator to spring closed. Note that the damper is not connected to the fire alarm system. The smoke detector, if uh, the code says, if uh, there's an alarm system in the building, and there almost always is, then the smoke detector contact will notify the fire alarm system. That determines what codes are going to be in effect when you go to do any work on the damper. Now, your engineered smoke control system, and there's a, you know, of course, a 
myriad variety of uh, different possibilities. But uh, here I show a stairwell pressurization system. Uh, you on a tall building are to control the pressure in the stairwell in case of an event. You want to keep about 0.1 inch to 0.25 inches of pressure against the doors to keep smoke from entering the stairwell so people can escape. But stairwells, underground buildings, corridors, auditoriums, atria, any large spaces, they're going to have engineered smoke control systems. And that's where the actuators are going to have to have switches on them. And in your engineered smoke control system, you're much more likely to have 24 volts. So really, it's important to make sure whether you got 120 or 24. That's probably the number one uh, uh, problem job uh, that, that occurs where the long voltage gets shipped out. And your smoke control systems, the fire alarm panel, which is... In a smaller building, it'll be the fire alarm panel serving as the smoke control panel also. Uh, it'll have a relay shown there in the middle. So if smoke is detected, that relay will open a contact and the actuator will spring closed. Instead of a duct smoke detector, you're, you're going to have a relay there. It might be a smoke damper only. There may not be a high temperature switch. Now in your smoke damper, We've got the relay there in the middle of the uh, drawing, a normally closed contact. Uh, if it's a smoke damper only, uh, there's your actuator. So this, the uh, smoke detection system is the only thing controlling it. And you'll have auxiliary switches or damper blade switches uh, that will provide position indication whether the damper is closed or open. So that's the addition that will exist for a Chapter 9 damper. The entire smoke control system architecture, uh, and this is a, a medium-large system. A real large system would have a workstation. Uh, but you're going to have, a, over on the left side, you, you have a firefighter smoke control system, either graphics panel or a regular uh, uh, discrete uh, component, light bulbs and switches, which is actually more common uh, panel. Uh, where they can override the damper, open, close. This shows the uh, reopenable damper on the right side. The center of all of this is actually the fire alarm panel. As far as the code officials are concerned, that's the most important thing. Then your smoke control panel is connected to it. Often they're the same panel. And then you're going to have a relay. Here it's it's called an input-output module, but that's going to that's going to be a module that will have contact closures to drive the damper open or cut power to it and it'll take the position indication switches from the damper and then via the network it'll indicate whether the damper is open or closed If you get your choice, this is really a little bit better of a way to do it, or it's an alternate that, that is simpler and therefore uh, easier to understand. Uh, but over on the left side, we've got our little firefighter smoke control panel. We've got open and closed position indication, the green and the red lights. And then there's a selector switch, so they can flip it to auto, in which case hot power goes to the smoke control relay through the high temperature limit and then drives the actuator open. If the smoke relay opens or if the temperature opens, the actuator springs closed. But if the smoke relay opens, they can override it. The switch could be flipped to open so hot power bypasses the smoke relay. If the wall is a firewall also, or barrier or partition, uh, that the high temperature limit still has to be able to close that damper if there's a fire right there at the wall. But the incident commander can bypass the smoke relay to either pressurize the space or remove smoke. And then the temperature limit is 250 degrees. That's code as the lowest temperature for making sure uh, on the UL555S test. Uh, 
but this gives you a simpler way to approach it. There are a number of ways. Um, but the big thing about the uh, specifications here is that auxiliary switches are forgotten. So you got to then add switches on top of the actuators, and not all actuators uh, have uh, auxiliary switches available for them. So it creates a problem. Um, so no other chapter seven or chapter nine. Chapter nine has to have the aux switches. Uh, roughly 90% of the actuators sold are 120 volts, but about 10%, or a little bit more than that, are 24 volt. And those tend to be the chapter nine applications because that's where you've got either control contractor installing them or the fire alarm contractor. And they're much more used to 24 volt. So your chapter seven wiring is there at the bottom left. You've got a regular duct smoke detector and it's connected to the fire alarm system. On the right side, we've got a chapter nine. The fire alarm panel has a relay that's controlling that actuator, and there's position indication going back to the fire alarm panel, and then it will either have a, a display on it or there'll be an uh, auxiliary panel modulating control. Uh, we're not seeing too much underfloor air distribution anymore, uh, but it's a good example. You've got a, what amounts to a BAV box uh, in the floor, and the shaft coming down the building has to have a fire and smoke damper in it. And you want to control the pressure in the plenum under the floor at about 0.1 inch max. Uh, so you could put in one modulating fire smoke actuator, and now you've got the fire smoke damper modulating to maintain the pressure. Saves you an extra damper or two. So this is how the wiring works. So suddenly you're, you're involved in control contractor work. But the on the far left, uh, this is an example of a, the balancing act, a balancing uh, relay used. But you can a uh, little device here. It's got actually four terminals, but we're only using three of them. So you got common power, just goes to common of the actuator. You got hot power, goes to the hot. And you got a signal it goes to three, and that's how everything is normally operated. But if you had a fire, you could close the damper by cutting, opening this switch, it would cause it to spring close. Or if you want to drive it all the way open, you have a relay which puts hot power onto the signal wire, and that'll drive it full open. At the same time, you open that hot power, you don't want to put it on the uh, output of a, a analog output controller because that would burn, blow up the uh, output or blow a fuse. Replacements and retrofits. That beer can, we did extensive research. It's from 1976. I got that picture last year. So there's been a lot of dampers. That we find like this, that market for replacements is huge. There are a lot of dampers out there not working. The codes require periodic testing of dampers. NFPA 80 and NFPA 105 are referenced by the International Building Code and the International Fire Code. They regulate the time and requirements for periodic inspections. NFPA 92 also has some remarks. The containment dampers, those that are installed for Chapter 7, well, you got to inspect them and test them at commissioning, then at the end of the first year, and then every four years in commercial, hospitals every six years. That every four years is, is the sticker here. People are not doing their periodic testing until the fire marshal gets irritated and makes them do it for any variety of reasons, but typically for non-compliance of buildings, fire protection systems. A chapter nine, if it's a dedicated 
in other words, uh, smoke control only, say in atria, makeup or damper. Well, they, they got to be tested twice a year, semi-annually. If it's not dedicated, typically part of the HVAC system, uh, the economizer damper is used to evacuate the damper. They got to be tested annually. Most fire protection systems have to be tested annually, and building owners aren't doing it. Uh, also in Chapter 9, any of the, the mechanical smoke removal dampers or uh, say a CO2 system for uh, uh, cooking, uh, those have to be tested uh, annually. So here's a typical old damper. It's probably from about 1990. James would have to tell me. But it's the old MA230 or 220 motor, a shaft spring there in the middle, fusible link right there holding the spring open. There were a number of varieties of this. Uh, this one also has uh, plate indication switches and uh, a fusible or a uh, bimetal right there. But it gives you an example of, of what you've got. Uh, to replace the actuator, well, the knee lock has to be uh, removed. Easily done on the bench, not so easy when you're standing on a ladder up above the ceiling. On a lot of them, what you have to do is disable that shaft spring. So you got to replace uh, the fusible link with a, a carriage bolt. We have a full instruction uh, showing step-by-step -step how to do this. Uh, pictures Pator provided, and then I added the text. And then you have to add the high temperature limit, the 165 degree, typically. Uh, so the HS10 Pottorf is has to be added because you're bypassing the old fusible link. Uh, this is an old picture I, I've got updated. But that gives you the steps that would have to be done for that type of a replacement. We have uh, multiple instructions by the damper manufacturer for step-by-step -step replacement repair of the uh, replacement of the actuator. We don't cover the rest of the damper. Uh, so it's at belimo.us fire smoke, and it jumps you right straight to uh, replacement instructions. And that's your best access to information for that this type of thing. The instructions, they start out with any number of warnings uh, telling you to, uh, you got to do it right. Uh, but then it covers UL, any of the code and standard issues, what NFPA 80 and 105 say. Uh, so you can see the uh, index down there. And it covers the subject pretty well. And the last page of each one of them is, it's an unofficial form, but it's valued by any of your fire marshals or building officials. Uh, did you check that damper and test it? Yes. So you drive it open and closed. Uh, you go through if there's any uh, the high temperature limit or any other uh, switches on it. Well, check them also. But it gives the uh, fire official the assurance that you've not just replaced it, but then you tested it. Torque for retrofit. Here's our rules of thumb, and they work out pretty well. So if you got less than a two square foot damper, you can use our TF model. If you got between two and four square foot, well, the LF works. And that meets uh, everybody's UL555 testing. Uh, these are a bit conservative, uh, but we don't need any problems. Uh, if they're between four and 12 square feet, you go to an FSNF. And if you got up to 18 square foot, well, you can go to uh, that modulating actuator or RFSAF. And these are at velocities less than 2,000 feet a minute. Our guide that's in the product guide and priceless does include some velocities above that so that one can gauge how much torque they want or need. I'm having a little trouble again with this dropping down. Uh, there we go. Remote testing. Uh, this is the last of the subjects here. NFPA 80 and 105 in 2018 version 
uh, allowed remote testing. So the periodic code testing that has to be done does not have to be visual inspection. You can use, in this case, a, a POTORF RCP, or they could use the uh, firefighter smoke control system relays to drive a damper open and closed, observe the lights, and that is sufficient to prove that that actuator and damper are working properly. The wiring's fairly simple. Over on the left side, top, we got hot power coming in, whether it's 24 or line voltage, doesn't matter. You go through the RCPs, and there are a variety of models. You could, this one shows a momentary uh, button to press. You could also get a keyed uh, switch. Uh, but you can press that, and that would cut power to the actuator, and it would spring the damper closed as long as you're holding the, the button. And then the switches on the actuator would first cut the open light on so that that green light would go off. And then once the damper closed, the red light would go on. So now you've proved the damper can close. You release the push to test switch. And the actuator is going to drive back open. And you can observe the green light go back on that the damper is open. You've now tested your damper. These are real nice for those impossible to get through dampers. And there are a lot of them out there. At least 5% are almost inaccessible. And one thing to note, uh, this is James Carlin for that, is the code does allow remote testing now. So uh, previously, the, there was a requirement for visual inspection uh, to make sure that damper opened and closed. But um, this offers a few things. Uh, as long as the damper's got indication switches, you can make sure they open and close from a remote panel, uh, or you can have an RCP box uh, that can be used to drive the damper open and close uh, if it's not used from a central command center. Uh, this also allows the building to set up automated systems that run automation, say when the building's not heavily used and send reports back to show that the dampers have operated, they've hit their open and close signals. Uh, and that way it does the least amount of interruptions in normal building use. You don't uh, necessarily have to have a group of technicians running around making sure uh, the dampers are visually open and closing that way. Uh, we also have time for some questions. Uh, feel free, if anybody's got any questions, they can enter them in the chat box. Uh, a couple of questions that have come up uh, before. Uh, one thing uh, to note, the uh, and I can talk to this, um, we do get questions a lot about uh, the dual temperature switches versus the single temperature switches. And uh, previously in older versions of the code before IBC, there was a requirement that the dampers had to close within a certain time of uh, fire temperature reading. Now the International Building Code basically allows two different types of fire damper actuation. If it's in the smoke control system, uh, it can be set to 250 or 350 if the system's set to operate at 350, as Larry had said earlier. If it's not in a smoke control system, so it's that chapter seven damper that Larry was talking about, uh, it can be set to pretty much 50 degrees above ambient temperature. What it doesn't say is that all of these dampers have to close within a certain time. So if you've got your smoke control system, you don't need the dampers to be reopenable. You can set it to that maximum temperature for that applicable system. And then if the fire damper or more commonly fire smoke damper does see localized heat up to that maximum temperature, it can be sure to shut down to make sure it's gonna protect that fire barrier. But until then, it can remain open. And this is really good for the first responders. What'll happen a lot of times with the first responders is they're in the heat of battle, you know, they're going into an emergency situation and there's a lot of varying information that they have to take in. So when they're dealing with some of these early smoke control systems that allowed reopenable dampers that had this big building map and all different lights that are over, you know, green or red to show where smoke or fire has been detected, 
they they really it's information overload it's too much to handle in the heat of battle in this type of emergency situation so what they most often do is go back to the containment mindset they shut everything down to make sure that fire and smoke are not going to spread and then as they can address the situation they can then reopen dampers and try to exhaust smoke out of the system some of the more uh, recent types of systems are a little more common uh, and uh, they're a little uh, easier to deal with. So basically what they'll do is make sure the damper sets to the maximum rate of temperature. They're going to stay open as long as possible. And if it does see that temperature, they don't have to be reopened. They'll close automatically. They'll protect the barrier. The barrier won't degrade and fall down around it, letting fire and smoke through the building. And they will be able to exhaust as much smoke as possible uh, until that last limit is reached. So this diagram that Larry's showing you now is no longer needed. Of course, if you see specifications for it and the engineer won't take any other options, we do have this available, but we try whenever we can to get the engineers to accept this single temperature diagram. It makes everything easier. It makes building costs lower. It makes it easier for first responders and firefighters to go in and do their job with as little extra information uh, than say a two position switch. So we typically recommend this as much as possible. Um, if there's any other questions, um, feel free to answer them in the chat. Um, other than that, I don't know if there's anything else uh, you want to add, Larry. Uh, we'll give everybody a few minutes just to answer questions. Of course, at the same time, uh, if, uh, uh, as you've seen in the last slide, and we'll send out uh, both Larry and my email contacts, uh, just to make sure if anything does come up, you can get a hold of us and let us know. A question popped up. Do you need to add auxiliary switches when you have a DSR-30? So for, for the DRS-30, it will come standard with one set of switches. Uh, that's the dual temperature responsive device. Uh, so it'll come with at least one set of switches. If you do have, and a lot of times these are used with 24 volt systems. So sometimes it's good to add a second set of switches. Uh, if the only set of indication is going back to a control panel, uh, you really only need one set of switches. So if it's all going back to a master set or a master control, um, you can use one set of switches uh, that are independent of the actuator uh, that can tie back to that 24 volt system. Now, if the system is all 24 volt and it's driving, uh, say and that's typically when you're using 120 volt actuator. If the actuator is a 24 volt system, a lot of times if say a, a localized momentary switch device is used or any other localized devices used, you're gonna have to tie that into, the momentary switch has to tie into the actuator voltage. So one set of switches will then be tied into that actuator voltage. If that's 120 volts, that won't work with the 24 volt for the control system. So a second set of switches is advised and we call those dry contacts. I know it's a bit confusing, but um, typically if you've got this smoke control system, a lot of times we recommend a second set of switches just in case to have that extra set of dry contacts um, that's completely independent of the actuator voltage. Even if everything is 24 volts, you may still need a second set of dry contacts. Now, there are options to deal with that in the field. Uh, the electricians can put in a relay to separate that signal, but typically we'll recommend uh, a second set of switches. It's not necessary for the DRS-30, um, but it is not a bad idea when you're dealing with the Chapter 9 smoke control systems that may need local indication as well as a set of switches that tie back to the alarm panel. That's certainly yeah. one thing you want to clarify with your customers, though. I didn't see who asked that question, but if you email me or James, we could draw you out the wiring. I, I could certainly do that. Okay, so it's, uh, we got about 13 minutes to the hour. We'll give everybody a couple of more minutes. Of course, if you don't have questions, feel free to leave the webinar now. Um, we won't be going any additional con uh, content, uh, but we'll leave it open for another couple of minutes just in case some last questions 
come up, of course. Thank you very much for attending. We appreciate everything you do for us. Um, and if there are any additional questions, we would be happy to address them. Great. Oh, here's a question. How do I know something of Chapter 7 or Chapter 9? Um, it's sometimes difficult. The consulting engineer has to be clear about that. And very often they're using boilerplate specs. So here's a damper. And they tell you some stuff about it. And, uh, you know, it's defining the gauge of the metal based on somebody's attempt at getting a flat spec 30 years ago. Uh, you have to read the whole spec and see where the dampers are going and if they're connected to the firefighter's smoke control system. Or call the consultant. But it can be vague at times. Yeah, it's definitely um, because of that use of boilerplate specs. You can't simply rely on needing a, a reopenable damper or two temperature damper. Um, you can't simply rely on even just um, a remote indication or a momentary switch because a lot of times they'll say it has to be automatically reopenable, um, which really means that if there's power cut and power is reapplied, the damper can be reopened um, per UL. There's no such thing as an automatically reopenable damper per that's been exposed to fire or heat that has to be manually reset for good reason. Uh, they want to make sure that switch will cut power to the actuator so bad things don't happen that actually it won't work or um, won't be energized as firefighters are potentially dousing this with water. So um, there's not going to be anything automatically reopenable if there's a heat event. But that doesn't stop engineers from putting that type of thing in a boilerplate spec. Yeah. So um, a lot of times it's best to request some more information or contact the engineer. Um, you can be safe and put in, say, an extra set of switches uh, if you don't know if it's a, nine, uh, a nine, chapter nine or a 909 smoke control system. But uh, it's going to be a bit vague because of, as Larry said, that use of boilerplate specs. Yeah, it's a, it's a real good question. Maybe one of the best ways to answer it is control their specifications. Get into every single one of your consultants, get a copy of their spec, and go through it and rewrite it to be clearer and make sure they understand. Uh, maybe it's a, a presentation that James and I ought to put together for uh, uh, the reps to be giving to uh, consultants, but uh, they need to pay attention to what they're doing too, and a lot of them are new and young and don't know, so you can be a big help. And of course, if you get a copy of that spec and you're unsure, you can always send it to me. I can always review it. I can look at it. I can point out some uh, potential issues, whether it's uh, something that will either single source them into a corner or force them into some type of more expensive solution than they really need. Um, so we can always help you in that respect. If you do get access to the spec, feel free to send it over. We'd be happy to review it and add as many comments, uh, set up a meeting to review with the engineer. Do uh, We've got some building code presentations that kind of go through some of the minimum requirements, some of the exceptions. So we'd be more than happy to address that if it is something you want to look at. But we need a day. I'm not seeing any other questions pop up. Are we yeah, good? I, th I think we are good for now. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank everyone for joining. Uh, we appreciate your time and uh, thank you for being with us and we'll let you get on with your day. Of course, once again, if there are any questions, uh, we will uh, address them offline. Uh, one thing to note, I'm sure this won't be an issue. Um, I will get a copy of the presentation from Larry. I don't think there'll be any issue with circulating that. So uh, if there are any requests for a copy of the presentation, let us know.